Good morning, and welcome once again to worship at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. Uh, coming to you live from my house this morning, and I'm so glad to be with you for this Sunday morning gathering. Um, definitely a very strange uh, uh, setup for us today, but uh, uh, given the impact of COVID-19, uh, we're just trying to keep everybody as safe as possible. Um, and so it's uh, just a great joy and honor to be able to come and share a little bit of God's word with you this morning um, and, uh, and worship together. <clears throat> um, we are here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church trying to follow closely the guidance of the Illinois Department of Health and the DuPage County Health Department. And so uh, we have um, chosen to close our building to public gatherings for a short time. Uh, we believe it's uh, in the best interest of everyone, ourselves, our staff, um, all the folks who may use our building. Um, so we hope that uh, by, by closing the building for this short time, um, we will be actually uh, making it much, much sooner that uh, we can get back to life as normal. Uh, last week, I hope that you had an uh, opportunity to join in as our worship leader, Jill Mix, did such a great job leading us in worship, um, and what a wonderful time of refreshing worship that was. Um, I am so honored today um, to be able to serve alongside uh, all of our staff members um, from our homes and from different places we find ourselves right now. Um, and so I'm so thankful for, for Jill, for the rest of the team, uh, and everything that they've been doing to keep um, our ministry alive and well. <clears throat> Today's going to be a little bit different um, from what you experienced last week. Most of you know that I um, recently spent a few days in the hospital, and uh, I had a very serious case of COVID-19. I am, um, in all honesty, still in the recovery phase, and so um, I, I'm not <clears throat> at a place vocally right now where I can sing for you, um, but I'm going to try to play a little bit of piano for you this morning so we have just a little bit of music. Um, I am feeling much, much better, stronger each and every day, um, so I'm just so excited to be able to join you this morning. I pray that what we experience together this morning will be, um, first and foremost, a beautiful time of worship, um, a beautiful, joyful noise to the Lord that we gather together. Secondly, I pray that it'll be refreshing for you, um, that it'll refresh our weary and troubled souls. Um, and third, I pray that uh, this would just be a faithful representation of the amazingly good and gracious God we serve each and every day. So I want to focus our hearts for worship this morning by seeking our great God together and asking him to come and gather together with us here. 
And so we begin our worship this morning, gathering then in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. We are the sheep of his hand. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, O church, rise up and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. For blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Amen and amen. Thank you. Scripture reading for this morning, we're going to read first from Isaiah 59, verses 15, through Isaiah 60, verse 3. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay, wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a plant, like the breath of the Lord driving along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, 
to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children, and on the lips of your descendants. From this time on and forevermore, says the Lord, for arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness now covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you. Nations will come to light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. This particular reading that I've just shared is a uh, very normal, very um, usual reading, selected for the very first Sunday of Advent. And today is the very first Sunday in Advent. If you've spent much time at all in the Christian church, um, in your life, you most certainly probably have heard these very, very um, traditional Advent words. Arise, shine, for your light has come. But I wonder, have we ever really thought long and hard enough about what is actually transpiring here in this passage? What is it that uh, Isaiah is actually calling God's people to? I want to read for you again how the passage starts. It really starts all the way back at chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 59. But even starting here at verse 15, we get a sense of why God has to lay this powerful call to worship on the heart of Isaiah. He said, The Lord looked around and he was displeased that there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. And so his own arm achieved salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. Why was God so displeased with his people? What had his people lacked with being faithful with him? The people of Israel had made a life for themselves, a way of life for themselves, where they were out following just about every and any God that they experienced. Rather than trusting Yahweh God fully, solely, they trusted in men and in chariots and in horses. They trusted in magic and in divinations. And what's worse, they trusted in themselves before God. And so, when God set his mind to the task of redeeming his people, restoring his people, bringing them back to him, he found himself asking a very familiar question. It's the question he actually asked Isaiah all the way back in chapter 6 of Isaiah's prophecy. He says, I need someone to go for me. Who will go for me? Who can I send? Now Isaiah's response back in chapter 6 comes as no surprise. That faithful prophet Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord, send me. And he goes to give this call to the people. But here in chapter 59, same prophetic word. Something has changed. Not for Isaiah, not for God, but for the people. When the Lord looked around, that he looked for someone that he might raise up so that the people could hear and know about the coming Messiah. There was nobody, nobody around. It was a vast desert of broken people broken promises, empty dreams, and most importantly, cluttered up hearts. So the Lord looked around, the word says, and found that there was no one, not even one. There was no justice and no one could intervene for his people. What was God going to do in the midst of that moment? Well, he had to give them someone, didn't he? Oh, and give he would. You see, the promise of the Messiah that had been given time and time and time again throughout Isaiah's prophecy. It was now time for that Messiah to come. The unfolding of Messiah. So as we embark on Advent each year, we hear these words, Arise, shine, your light has come. We call ourselves to a month of Preparation for the coming of the Savior. 
The glory of the Lord rises over us. The the darkness is going to go away. The light of the world, Jesus the Savior, is coming. And so I invite you to Advent this year as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Messiah. Well, as we continue our worship this morning, we would love to have you join us together in a time of prayer uh, this morning. I um, want to remind everyone, um, if you are part of our CFCC mailing list, um, you received a virtual bulletin in your email box this morning, and um, in that virtual bulletin you will find uh, our updated prayer list. Um, I'm afraid it may not include every single um, prayer requests that has been uh, be given to us. Um, I've tried very, very hard to sort of keep those in line and, and get them added there. If you have a request um, that you don't see listed there, um, please reach out to us at faithful60108 at gmail.com and we will be sure to get it added to the list. A couple of quick announcements also this morning before we pray together. Um, this coming Wednesday, um, we are going to gather together the prayer team. Um, this will be only online via Zoom. Um, in that virtual bulletin, there is a link that you can click on that will take you to the Zoom prayer meeting. This will happen Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. I think it's critically important for us to be together in prayer and to call together the prayer team uh, in this very difficult time. Um, <sighs> we also want to let you know that we have a, we have a plan in place for uh, moving forward with our Sunday morning worship gatherings. Uh, for the time being, we are not going to be having folks in the sanctuary, but we will continue to provide this virtual uh, opportunity for worship. 
Our hope is that uh, members of our staff and our praise team will be feeling um, even more uh, back to normal by next Sunday. And perhaps we may be able to be back um, uh, with a, a little bit of a praise team um, singing for you uh, on Sunday morning. We hope that you'll pray with us that that can happen. Um, if not, you'll uh, have one of these great um, CFCC at home editions uh, again next week. With that, let's uh, pray together and ask the Lord to uh, continue to just be with us. Let's pray. Well, Father God, <coughs> we thank and praise you that you have been so good to us. We recognize, Lord, that we are in the midst of just an incredibly difficult time. There are so many, Father, who are sick. There are so many who are struggling with COVID-19. Father, it is a terrible, terrible virus. It impacts everyone in so many different ways. Some, Father, completely lose their breath. And so, Lord, what we need more than ever in the midst of this time is you, your breath. The power and the presence of your Holy Spirit coming and washing over us. Lord, we need you in so many ways. We need you first to, to, to cleanse us, to cleanse our hearts of our sin, to cleanse our minds of all of the things that, that take us away from you, to cleanse our bodies of the impact of this virus. Father, we need you to provide for us. There are so many, Lord, whose lives have been completely uprooted financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Father, we greatly need your provision and your care. And Father, this morning we need your healing. There are so many, Lord, that we are aware of that are struggling with COVID-19. There are others who have new diagnosis of cancer. There are some who have been battling uh, debilitating blood infections. Lord, there are so many who are desperately, desperately in need of your healing touch. We ask that you would be with all those whom we love who are suffering today. Father, we don't just come asking, though. We also come thanking. Father, this past week was Thanksgiving, and while, Lord, it may not have felt like Thanksgiving or, or no, the Thanksgivings we've known before, Father, we have so much to be thankful for. You have seen us through this. You will continue to see us through this. You are making those who have been sick around us well. Folks are recovering. Father, you have provided for us. You've made it so that this place, Cornerstone Faith Community Church, could continue and continue its ministry, even in this incredibly difficult time. And so, Father, we must say thank you. We are so thankful for all that you've done for us. Now, Father, as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word this morning, we just ask that by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, you would open our ears, open our hearts and our minds, that we might be able to hear this word you have for us and rightly apply it to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the scripture text we're going to take a look at today um, for our time of uh, meditation is Isaiah chapter 2. So I'd ask that uh, wherever you are, you would maybe uh, either open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2 um, or listen along as I read for you from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2 starting at verse 1. <clears throat> 
This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted above all the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob, for he will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, and he will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. O come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You know, um, there are many, many things in this world today that I am unsure of. For instance, last week, I was admittedly unsure whether or not I would be able to overcome the effects of COVID-19 on my body. At one point last week, I was so weak, I was so scared, that all I could do is hug my wife and cry. I don't think that I was ever fearful of dying. I was pretty sure that I was not going to die. But I wasn't sure of much else. Would I suddenly find myself unable to breathe? Could this get bad enough that I would have to uh, have the assistance of a respirator? What kind of long-term effects might this have on my body? Now you add to this the uncertainty of what I should be doing in that moment. It was a terrifically scary experience. I wondered, should I go to the immediate care and, and, and get some help there? I wondered if I should go directly to the emergency room. I wondered if there was a need to call an ambulance. Ultimately, I believe that Sarah helped me to make the best decision. We called and got an appointment at an immediate care facility. The doctor there urged me to go to the hospital. And once, it is, once I was at the hospital, I was urged to stay for a few days so that the doctors could keep a close watch on me and provide me much needed medication, which is only available intravenously. Well, by the grace of God, because of his good healing for me, I'm able to sit here with you all this morning. I'm feeling much better, even though I still have such a long way to go before I will feel normal again. So I am sure of this today, that God does hear our desperate, desperate, fervent prayers. And God truly does heal us. Even still, there is so much more that I am uncertain about today. More than simply things of my own health or my own well-being. For example, this time of year is usually so overscheduled for myself and my family that we often get to Christmas morning and we have no desire to do anything except for simply sit and be still. Sleep is most often at the very top of my wish list at Christmas time. And truth be told, I usually do get sick at some point around Christmas because I push my body too hard and it bites me in the rear end every time. But what about this year? Talk about the uncertainty. Here we are, the first Sunday of Advent. And to say that I have never felt less prepared for the Christmas season is probably the greatest understatement. Twice now, members of our CFCC staff and worship team have spent time meeting together virtually with the express purpose of trying to set in place some plans, some kind of plan for Advent. And while we all have hopes and aspirations, all of us have been impacted by the COVID-19 virus. Every one of our vocalists, every one of our vocalists is currently recovering at some level from a viral lung infection. 
that doesn't bode well for the Christmas merriment and music we are so used to. All but one of our CFCC staff members has tested positive for the virus as well. Now, thankfully, most have had very minimal symptoms. Still, we're facing fatigue and the impact of the virus on our bodies. And so Christmas doesn't just happen in the life of the church. It takes people and staff and preparation and work. And this year, well, what does that mean? Do we have some sort of plan in place for Christmas at Cornerstone Faith Community Church? Yes, we do. But the $25,000 question, of course, is this. Will we have the opportunity to enact that plan? The $25,000 answer is, we have no idea. There are so many things that I am so completely uncertain about this year. Let me be honest about this fact, too. It's a terribly discouraging place for me to be as your shepherd, your brother, your fellow servant of Christ. I want so badly to serve you, to love you, to bring you to the manger side of Jesus, our Savior, and light candles and sing. But frankly, at this point, I'm just not sure how we do it. All of this certainty, or uncertainty, all of this uncertainty could bring what some people would call a death nail to even the strongest of ministries and strongest of church families. But today I want to give you a word of encouragement. This simple token of the gospel of Jesus Christ for each of our lives amid all of this uncertainty that's going on. COVID-19, now I hope you're listening. COVID-19 will not separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Not today, not tomorrow, not Christmas Eve, not Christmas morning. And that's what leads me into this new series that we're launching today, Preparing for the Messiah. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look specifically at Isaiah's words about getting ready for Jesus. After all, that's what truly Advent is supposed to be about, getting ready for Jesus. We're going to take the next four weeks to get our hearts ready, to get our minds refocused, to get our priorities in order, to make, as John the Baptist said so well, a highway in the desert for our God. But this won't be like any other Advent series you've ever heard before. We're not going to spend time talking about shepherds and angels and mangers and wise men. We're not going to watch as Mary visits Elizabeth or as Mary's excitement grows for the birth of her son. We're not going to listen to the angels speak words of comfort to, to Joseph, the future father of the Savior of the world. Yes, each of those things is critically important. I'm not trying to argue that they don't exist or something of that nature. They are what Christmas is. But this year, amid so much uncertainty, it dawned on me this. Why spend our time reminding ourselves yet again about that which we already are so sure of. You see, I'd wager that <coughs> you're just like me when it comes to the Christmas narrative. You know that Elizabeth and Zechariah gave birth to John, who came as a messenger to bring attention to Jesus the Savior, and Mary, the virgin, is made pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, and she gives birth to a baby, a real human baby, Jesus. This baby is God's very own son, the Savior of the world. <coughs> when Jesus was born, the shepherds came to worship him. All of heaven's angels sang and the wisest of the world's men came to bow down to him. When Jesus was born, the glory of God, the glory of the God of all the world, was on display for all mankind to see. These are all things that I, we, know for certain, 100% about the Christmas narrative. But did you ever stop to consider this one important point? The Christmas narrative didn't end when Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt, escaping that murderous edict from Herod, the emperor of Rome. In fact, the Christmas narrative 
didn't even end when Jesus was raised up on that tree in Calvary's mountain, suffering and dying. And the Christmas narrative didn't end when Jesus ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. Instead, the Christmas narrative is still unfolding today. We have been told what will happen one day when King Jesus returns to gather his people together. To wage a final war against sin and Satan. We know that we will be joined together with him in his millennial kingdom. We know that one day a new heaven and a new earth will come and we will live forever and forever in paradise with Christ. But here's the thing. The question before us is, are we ready? Are we ready every single day for Messiah to come? Or is preparing for Jesus a task that we only take on for four Sundays a year right before we open up our gifts and Sing our Christmas carols. Advent. <clears throat> that word Advent literally means coming into place, coming into view, or an expected arrival. One Bible dictionary defines the use of the word Advent as a commonly <coughs> referring phrase to the four Sundays leading up to the observation of and the commemoration of the birth of Jesus Christ. Now that made me stop and think for a moment. Is that all that we're doing here in Advent? Is that all that Christmas really truly means? It's an opportunity to observe or commemorate the birth of Jesus? How unfinished that idea seems. How short-sighted we must be if we understand this opportunity, this privilege, to prepare our hearts for Jesus as nothing more than commemorating him. You know, in that case, why don't we just get a big birthday cake, right? Get a couple of gift cards, throw a party, sing happy birthday, and move on. I think Advent is more than getting ready for a birthday party. <coughs> Recently, I've had several emails and phone calls from folks in the church family. And I'm sorry, I haven't necessarily responded personally yet to these contacts, but I promise I will very soon. But here's what each of them is writing or calling about. They say, you know, Pastor, something's really been on my heart in these last few weeks, especially as COVID-19 is kind of ramped up on us again. I can't help but wonder, Pastor, if God's purpose in all this sickness, in all of this disease, in all of this difficulty and loneliness, this isolation, isn't to shift our focus from everything else that we've come to be finding so important in our lives and instead get that focus back on Him. One brother said it this way. He said, maybe he is showing that America and the world needs to wake up and focus on him again. America and the world seem to have strayed away from him with some of the views and laws that are passed. This could be the start of a revival. Let me assure you of this, brothers and sisters. This had better be the start of a revival. If we have suffered through the tumultuous time called COVID-19, and we find ourselves coming out the other side of this horrible experience with no greater understanding, no more refined focus, no fonder attention for God who has seen us through all of this. What a momentous shame that would be for us all. What a disgrace it would bring on God's name, on the gospel of Christ, on the love of God our Father. And so because I couldn't agree more with my brothers and sisters, who have reached out to me, urging that we refine our focus and shift our eyes back to God and Christ, first and always, decided to spend this Advent season encouraging us to prepare our hearts for Messiah, the King Messiah, who will come not as a baby in a manger, but as a rider on a white horse, sword of truth, belt of righteousness, to defeat the adversary Satan, and all of his sinful ways. That's what we have to be readying our hearts for. That is where we need the most 
desperate preparation. So quickly in week one here of our preparation for the Messiah, I want to tell you that Jesus is coming. And when he comes, Isaiah tells us in chapter two, he will be called the mountain of the Lord. (coughs) Truth be told, the idea behind each of the messages in this series to look at some description that Isaiah gives us about Jesus, in particular about his second advent, his second coming, his return, what it will look like. The first of those depictions comes in Isaiah 2, where the Messiah is referred to as this mountain of the Lord's temple. So we look at ourselves, we ask this, that means Jesus is going to come back as a mountain? Well, Yes, sort of, in a matter of speaking. Jesus won't return to earth as a large rock formation or suddenly protrude up from below the surface of the earth to become a white-capped pile of stone. Folks won't be lining up for a chance to slalom down the, the slopes of Mount Jesus, but this much we can be certain of. When Jesus comes again, he will bring with him the very foundation, the very bedrock of the kingdom of God. He will usher in a, a sense of a firmament like we have never known before. Isaiah actually talked about this in chapter 40. He said these very, uh, well, what, what we view as very famous words now, but he said, comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. For a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill made low, and every rough ground shall become level, and every rugged place a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the Lord has spoken it. Many Bible scholars agree that when Isaiah was given this word in chapter 2, his prophecy, the word about the coming Messiah being this mountain of the Lord, there was a very real and present message for Israel in that time and that day. If someday even Gentiles were going to come to know and trust God and God's Messiah, then shouldn't Israel itself straighten up and fly right? Shouldn't Israel even now walk in the light of the Lord? Of course they should. And so the ones who would come to know God in the future and trust God need an example, a worthwhile example to follow. But Israel wasn't ready to be that example. They still had their priorities all out of whack. They'd rather chase after the latest, greatest things of the world rather than patiently wait on the faithful one. So maybe you're beginning to see a bit of a connection for you and I today. We really haven't made it all that far from Israel in over 3,000 years of history. We are just as preoccupied, just as obsessed, just as easily swayed as Israel was. But the other piece of this puzzle is that the promise hasn't changed. When Jesus comes, he will bring to life this very foundation of God's kingdom. He will be for us, for all people, the very mountain of the Lord, on whom the rest of eternity will rest. (coughs) If we reach back into Israel's broken, sin-stained past, we find that time and time again, when the hearts of God's people wandered away to lust after false gods of this world, we almost always find God's people in the same place. They've gone up to high mountains. Why did they go up to high mountains? Because that's where you meet with gods. It's just the way it is. It isn't just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh God, who is said to have dwelled up there somewhere. Almost every God ever known to this world has been said to live up there, up high, in the high mountains. In Athens, for example, the great pantheon of the gods had a temple built for them. It was at the top of a hill called Temple Mount. 
In Asia, where Buddhism has been practiced for centuries, you'll most often find temples and shrines to Buddha on the side of a road of a fog-covered mountain or hill. <coughs> Jerusalem itself, the holy city, is called a city on a hill. No matter where you come from, north, south, east, or west, you have to go up in order to get to Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, the high places are not simply reserved for the dwelling places of the gods. Every lust of our hearts, every whim of our desire, requires us to rearrange things in our minds, placing, for what time at least, whatever we are bent to follow at the top of our list. And suddenly we find ourselves, at least figuratively anyways, going up, looking up to the places that we think things dwell that we desire. One of my most favorite <coughs> Broadway musicals was a smash hit musical for writer Frank Lesser in 1961. It starred Robert Morris and Michelle Lee. It was called How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Now the musical follows a young and upcoming um, young window washer who sets his eyes on becoming the executive of a large company. But he wants to get there to that point of being an executive as quickly as possible, doing as little as possible. And so he happens upon this book called How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. And the chapters that ensue find Ponty, J. Pierpont Finch, this window washer, escalating up the rank and file of a company called the Worldwide Wicket Company. And in no time, he becomes a junior executive. Actually, just under a week's time, he becomes an executive. Now, of course, along the way, there are bumps in the road, but Ponty always seems to be able to fake his way through it. And early on in the musical, there's a great quote from the nephew of the owner of the company. Bud Frump is the president's nephew, and he's bent on making his way up the ladder faster than J. Pierpont Finch can. As Bud is given a quick promotion over Ponty, he turns to the young eager executive wannabe Ponty, and he says this, Hey, Ponty, I sure hope you like the view from down there, because every time you try to take a step up the ladder, you're going to see the seat of my pants. Isn't that basically kind of what we're talking about today? What is it that we actually see when we look up? Maybe the better questions to be asked are these. When we look up, what are we looking for? Who are we expecting to see when we look up? What or who have we placed on the high places of our lives? Of what real benefit are the things we so easily elevate to places of importance in our lives? <coughs> I don't know about you, but when I look up, when I look up to the high places, I don't want to see the seat of somebody's pants. I surely don't want to see the temporary fading earthly things of this world. When I look up, I want to see Jesus. I want to see God. I want to see treasures that can't be destroyed by moths or, or rust or time. You know, in, in, in Psalm 121, King David gets right to the very heart of why we should look up, what we should hope and expect to see. He says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains, for where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, and he will not let my foot slip. He who watches over me will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. <clears throat> For the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. For the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. It's usually at this time of year, don't you think, that people start asking an all-too-familiar question? What would you like to have for Christmas this year? Now, if I was a betting man, I would bet a large sum of money that most people's answers this year will be relatively the same. I'd bet that most people this year are going to have lists filled with things like this family. 
I want my family to be able to come over for Christmas this year. I want all of us to be able to be there. Healing. I, I, I want to feel better. I want my loved ones to feel better. Relief. I want to, this pandemic to be done. Over with. I, I want to be set free from the difficulty that it causes. Uh, people might be asking for financial stability. They want to know that they're going to be able to pay their bills, that their jobs are secure. I was actually just reading an article yesterday morning about the best deals for Black Friday. <clears throat> of course, Black Friday didn't prove to be so black this year as most retailers are in need of something so much more than just one day of shopping to get their accounts back out of the red. But <clears throat> there was a list of about 15 different gifts that are supposed to be topping Christmas wish lists this year that were on sale over the weekend. What I couldn't help but notice was this. None of the deals were really all that spectacular. I mean, sure, one could purchase a, a TV for $300 off, but the price was still over $1,500 for the TV. And yes, there were gadgets and technologies abundant to be had, but they come with a price. I saw very little on the list that even provoked my interest. I rather doubt that anyone I know would even have an interest in these things either. Why is it? What makes this year so different? Could it be a shift in perspective? Could it possibly be a return to what truly means something for our lives, for our families, for our neighbors, our faith, our God? That's probably a wish list too. Maybe our brother was right. Maybe this is the beginning of something really big. Maybe Revival starts here for us. Maybe COVID-19 has benefits along with it, its profound devastations. Maybe the evil virus is shifting our focus back to God and away from the trappings of this world. Maybe we're starting to hope we will see something a little different when we look up to the high places. <coughs> so, how do we apply this to our lives? How should we be different based upon what we've experienced in God's word today? I want to offer you just one point of application today. It's one simple point that I think we all need to begin to apply to our lives each and every day, not just during Advent, not just during Christmas. What are you looking for? And where are you hoping to find it? In verse 3 of Isaiah 2, we read these words. <coughs> Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. Why is it so important that we bear in mind that Jesus is going to be the mountain of the Lord? Why is it so critical for us to understand that when Messiah comes, the Messiah we are preparing for, he will establish this rock-solid foundation of God's kingdom? The reason is because we have so much to learn. We are still so unaware of the things of God. We tend to follow after earthly things, earthly people, because we can see them, we can touch them, we can understand them. But God is sometimes confusing, confounding, frustrating, maybe even seeming distant from us. So we take the easy way out. We try to succeed at life without really trying. And as we look up, we follow the seat of the pants of whoever has drawn our attention that particular day. But if COVID-19 has taught us anything, anything at all, it's that this life, this journey, is anything but easy. There is absolutely no way to succeed other than trying and trying hard. And in order to try, we need to know what to try. I love verse 5 of our text for today. It's this call from Isaiah that says, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Jesus is coming back again. He is coming for us. 
Jesus is coming again. The same Jesus <coughs> who came as the infant of the manger. And the same Jesus who walked this earth as a suffering servant. And the same Jesus who hung on the cross and, and rose from the grave. That very same Jesus is coming. And this is why we must prepare our hearts. So we can come and worship Christ the newborn king. And we can come and worship Christ the suffering king. And we can come and worship Christ the king who has come again. Keep looking up, brothers and sisters, in eager, hopeful expectation for when the Messiah will come as the mountain of the Lord. And we shall know fully then all he has done for us. Let's make our hearts ready for Jesus, the, the mountain of our Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this word to us today about the mountain. Jesus is indeed your mountain, the very foundation, the firmament of everything that is for us. Father, yes, as we prepare for the infant Jesus, as we prepare for Christmas, may we also be preparing our hearts for King Jesus, Savior, Messiah, who will come for us. Father, as we look up to high places, may we always be seeking you. May we be looking for you, for your things. Father, shift our focus, we pray, from the things of this world that pass away to you, which lasts forever. Father, help us to prepare our hearts for the coming Messiah each and every day. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. <coughs> amen. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, my voice is giving out. My breath is beginning to give out. So, um, let me just offer you this word of benediction. Um, thank you so much for joining me for worship this morning. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you go out into this world, preparing for the Messiah Jesus, would you go with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be with you this day, and forevermore. Amen? We'll see you next week. Thank you.